Gary, get ready to host. Well, we're going to dive back into the story. Uh, if you have not been with us, and um, it, like I said, this document, if you're just joining us, you can go get it linked in the post and join in the document with me if you'd like. Um, we are going to dive back into the story. I'll catch you up a little bit of where we've been. But before we do, uh, let me pray for us. God, thanks for uh, the chance to be able through technology uh, to be able to join together like this each morning. Um, to be able to learn and grow through the study of your word, that uh, it's not just about what we learn in this time, but it's about learning how to learn. And it's about this this abiding, this connecting, staying close to you in times like this. I truly pray that for us, God, this would not be the end of our time with you today. It would really mark the beginning of our time. And uh, I pray that you would keep us close to you today. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, everybody. So uh, let's see here. Uh, oh, Sarah said Facebook's been difficult. I'm sure that I'm sure that Lisa will appreciate that empathy there. Uh, Becky, my only experience involved my horse attempting to to scrape me off in a grove of aspens. Ouch! That's that is ouch. Um, cool. All right, so we are in Second Samuel 16, um, and we have been looking at the big picture story, right? Of Israel wants a king, like other nations have. God's like, hey, how about I be your king? Good news, I'm God. I have no beginning. I have no end. Uh, I will never be corrupted. I will uh, never fail you or let you down. And Israel's like, sounds great. Uh, but we really like how those kings over there are people that others can see and respect and fear. So we're going to go with those kinds of kings. And God's like, no, 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 I really. And they're like, no, no, no. And so after a while, God gives them what they want. They get it in Saul. He is everything they wanted. And that turns out not what they needed. And so after failed uh, attempt and missed expectation and wrong motive, uh, eventually God says, okay, I'm moving on from Saul. And he anoints this young guy, David. David then is on the run for years uh, after defeating Goliath and showing himself faithful and really loyal to Saul. Saul still feels threatened by him. And uh, now Saul has died. Jonathan, his son, and David's best friend has died. And David is taking over the kingdom. And on kind of his first act this week, we've we've talked about the fact that he is bringing the Ark of the Covenant, this unique thing that God's presence uniquely resided in at this point in Israel's history, and bringing it from Hebron, where it was with Saul, down to the city of David, Jerusalem. The first place that we, or the first time we saw this happen on Tuesday, uh, he had done some things that he thought would be a really great idea. He said, "I got a new cart; it's going to be awesome." Uh, Uza, you go ahead and you know just keep an eye on it for me. Um, but it was not the way that God wanted this moved. He had communicated that very, very cl clearly and specifically. Um, and then, as the cart is tipping, as this is being done in not the way that God intended, Uza goes to like try to save it, and God kills Uza for in inappropriately handling the ark. And so we talked all about that. So if you're like, if you're hearing about this for the first time, you're like, oh, that is insane. Uh, go check out um, uh, the the time that we had together on Tuesday. That'll break that down for you. Then it ends up at this guy Obed-Edom's house and he is blessed. His whole family is blessed because he has this, uh, David catches word of that. And he's like, I think it's time for it to come back to Jerusalem now. I think let's make it the rest of the way. And so yesterday, uh, we saw the beginning of that journey. They go six steps. And then as custom states, they stop. They offer these really specific sacrifices. And they are doing it the way that God told them to do it, to get to Jerusalem. Now, we enter the section of the story called lowering tension um, or falling action. And uh, we're going to look at kind of some specific lessons, right? We talk about this idea that, well, there are ways we can learn at any point in a story. When we get to the lowering tension part, that's where the primary application is. Usually that's where the author of the story is designing you to be able to see and find primary application. So we're going to we're going to see that. We're going to get introduced maybe I'm not sure we've been introduced in our time to Mikel um but we'll be introduced to her David's um or, or one of Saul's uh why or one of Saul's daughters and uh one of David's wives. So uh we'll we'll see a little bit of there. And then the question that you're thinking about today is what are the characters learning, right? So we've got David, we got God's people, and we've got Mikel that are all uh, learning some lessons. And we said this last time we did this, not always the right lessons, like not always good ones, but they're learning lessons. And then we'll extrapolate our own application from there. All right. Uh, oh, let me see. Crystal said, I have such good news this morning. Uh, UCH, the hospital on the Anschutz Medical Campus last night declared the end to the code yellow, a pending emergency or, or, or external disaster not letting our guards down 
but a sign of returning to normal. That's amazing. Hey, Crystal, thanks. That's so cool. Wow. That is amazing news. Fantastic. Awesome. Praise God. Uh, Lisa, nice place. I used to sell a lot of Red Roof Barn. I'm in Grant. Oh, look at this. You guys are you guys are connecting. That is great. All right, 2 Samuel 6, beginning of verse 16, reads like this. It says, As the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Jerusalem, Michal, the, uh, the daughter of Saul, looked out the window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. And they brought in the ark of the Lord and set it in its place inside the tent that David had pitched for it. And David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. And when David had finished offering burnt offerings and peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts and, dis and distributed among all the people, the whole multitude of Israel, both men and women, a cake of bread, a portion of meat, and a cake of raisins to each one. Then all the people departed, each to his, to his house. And David returned to bless his household, but Michal, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said how the king of Israel honored himself today, uncovering himself today before the eyes of his servants, female servants, as one of the vulgar fellows shamelessly uncovers himself. So, uh, neat. Hey, look at this. Lisa, who it looks like is still not able to join us via video, is, is highlighting things right now. Oh, Lisa, you're the best. I am sorry for whatever's going on. We will fix it after today. I'm certain of that. Um, so what we're diving into here is David is finally getting the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem. Great news, right? That's kind of what they've all been waiting for. Obviously, take one did not go very well. We end up kind of here with take two. Obed Edom's getting blessed. He's like, we're going to need that back. And as they do it, they do it all the right way. And this is describing the end of this 10 mile journey that the Ark of the Covenant had taken. Um, and it says that the, as all this is happening, the daughter of Saul, Michal, uh, looks out her window and sees David leaping. Now, um, you don't know Michal, but this was kind of destined to be a problem on a bunch of different levels, right? If you can think of one of those levels, feel free to put it in the comments. I'll list a few of them. Uh, one of the reasons that uh, it, this was difficult was because Michal was actually not Saul's first choice for David. Uh, actually, Saul had said, hey, I've got a daughter for you. This was tied to him beating Goliath. So if he said, if any of you beat Goliath, you go in there and you fight, face the champion, this Philistine champion, and you defeat him, I will let you marry one of my daughters and you'll never pay taxes, right? And so David didn't do it for that reason, but he gained that reward because he did it. Um, and so Saul was like, hey, I've got this daughter for you. It's going to be great. And then it was like, oh, shoot, I've already promised that one to someone else. Like that for sure happened. And so he's like, here you go. You can have McCall. And so that it was already second choice. You kind of wonder all the inner workings of how did that look? How did that sound? I, I cannot imagine for McCall how that must have felt because she knew. She knew that she wasn't the original one. And so that is how their relationship got started. Um, and then pretty quickly in their relationship, there is uh, like a lot of challenges, right? Like Carrie here says that they they had divided loyalty. So for Mikhail, she she loved her dad. She loved Saul and she loved her husband and trying to figure out uh, how do I how do I do what I'm supposed to do as a wife and at the same time as a daughter? And so at one point. Um, there's this really, we talked about it, I think last week, there's this really elaborate hoax that she conspires where she sets up like in the movies, you know, where they set up somebody. So it looks like they're still in bed. She did that, uh, with David to give him time to escape so that, uh, Saul couldn't come in and get him. And so like, she does that, uh, but then some other stuff happens. Right. And so I think that, uh, <laughs> Greg said, I guess David's dance moves did not meet with McCall's approval. They did not. They did not. That is a true statement. Um, but the, a couple of additional things happen. One, David keeps acquiring wives, which is just never a good plan. Like if you've got a wife, you have enough wives. Like just, just one. That's all we need. Just one. As a matter of fact, it's kind of the pattern set out in, Gen in Genesis. Just, just one wife. Just have one. Um, but David struggles with this. Solomon, his son, is going to struggle with it even more. Um, we talked about some of the generational impact of that yesterday. And so uh, David has more than one wife and and he's on the road a ton, like a ton. And there are specific wives like Abigail that is very obvious in David's life that he has a deeper connection to. Like that there is just something where 
you know, nobody's FaceTiming. We don't know what correspondence got sent back and forth. He's not home for a long time. And so uh, at the same time, because, you know, Mikel is with Saul and there's all kinds of controversy, um, actually, she gets remarried too. And so she gets remarried to this guy named, I've got it in the side right here. Uh, she gets remarried. Um, and and the thing that's really interesting, uh, Paul Tial, is that David actually sends and gets her back from this guy, but she doesn't get him back or he doesn't get her back to like, come live with him. He gets her back to basically just sit and wait for him. And so there's like a whole bunch of stuff that's just not going well. She has another husband. He has more wives. They're not living anywhere near each other. She's just watched her dad die. She doesn't really know as much about David. She knows probably my dad shouldn't be trying to kill him, but my dad has been the one that's been trying to care for me this entire time. Like all those things are swirling around in her mind. Um, Cassie said, uh, was she angry that she was that he was dancing with others and not his wife? I think it was deeper than that. I don't think, like we talked about yesterday, I think this was more... Uh, like a processional where David was like out front than it was uh, he was dancing with other individuals. Uh, some commentators asked the question, like, why wasn't she out there? Like, it's, it's obvious that there were women that could be there. So like, why wasn't, and I think she was just so mad. She like, didn't even want to be there to welcome him because what she had to say was not going to be for public consumption as we see. Um, and so I think, you know, the, the, um, uh, Sarah said this. Uh, so I was thinking about the situation with Mikel, especially with her father and maybe favorite brother, uh, just having been killed in a battle with the Philistines. And she's probably in a lot of grief. I think that's totally true, especially Jonathan, right? Like we just, he was just a great guy, uh, that I'm sure was awesome to her too. He's awesome to everybody that we see, even to Saul who didn't deserve it. Right. Crystal said, Mikel doesn't understand and doesn't share in David's joyful worship. So she hated it. Perhaps she feels that she's never been celebrated or seen as thus has contempt for. That's an interesting perspective, Crystal, that she's watching David probably have a level of excitement and exuberance, obviously about God, but she's never felt any of that about her. And so I'm sure that that, that that's probably absolutely part of it. That's great perspective. Vicky says, so the wives thing would be an example that just because something is culturally normal, it doesn't mean that it's appropriate um, or approved by God a thousand percent. Yep. Yep. So we, we use this language a lot when we talk about this between the difference between something that's prescriptive and descriptive, right? Prescriptive, God says, do this. Descriptive is this is the way it was done, but it's not the way God would want it done. We see that a lot. We see that a lot in Saul's life, a lot in David's life, and a lot in Solomon's life. This weekend, actually, we're going to spend some time with David and Bathsheba. And that is absolutely something uh, that, well, he could get away with it was not what God wanted, and, and he faces consequences for it. Uh, and then Peggy said, McCall has been uh, passed around as a wife. That has to hurt. I mean, yeah, in, in some ways it almost feels like a like a Jewish version of sex trafficking. Like this, this woman has had an awful go of it. Like, hey, you're married to the next king. Amazing. Incredible. Yeah, you weren't the first choice, but like go be with them. It'll be fine. And then it's like, oh, wait, actually, I don't like him anymore. I'm going to try to kill him. And then you're torn with what do I do? I'm going to let him go. And then I don't hear from him anymore. And now there's this other guy and he's actually here for me. And now my dad, like, it is just, I, I think it's easy to look at this and be like, oh, Mikel, what? that's terrible. But I, I think a lot more of us would be responding the way she does than we think, given the circumstances that she faces. And and I just think it's it's hard to understand in our culture now, how long you could go in a marriage, having never seen one another, having not talked to one another, um, the, the, the kind of strings that we feel if we don't talk to loved ones for days or weeks, think about that for years, because that's the insinuation that we have in this story in terms of the time length that has happened. Lisa, what's up? Good to see you. We miss you. We miss seeing your face. It's good to see you guys on here. David has been gone for a long time. Uh, she had been given to another guy. David demands she returns and is now um, one of many wives. Yeah, that that probably was not a fun realization. Like, I hope I hope she knew about that before this moment because that was going to be a bad reveal. Uh, and yeah, Becky said being used is never good for the soul. It isn't. And when you realize it, like, it's just so damaging. 
so damaging. So anyway, that's the that's the kind of framework that we're putting in place here. And David is not doing anything wrong in this moment, right? Like David is celebrating that this ark, that this pre unique presence of God has been brought to Jerusalem, that is not only going to become the base of operation for David and his leadership, but is actually going to become this really historic location for Israel for the rest of human history, like to this day. And so um, he's he's excited, so excited. Meanwhile, Mikal, who's already kind of made up her mind about David, is despising her or despising him in her heart. They get it back. They set it in its place, which was inside this specific tent that had been set up for it. David, just like there was this, this practice of, hey, we're six steps in. Let's make sure we offer these specific sacrifices. Uh, now we have uh, David going, okay, it's here. Now we're, we got burnt offerings and peace offerings, specific types of offerings that were made at this specific moment in exactly the same way. Uh, commentators reflect that perhaps this is another indication uh, that David had actually at some point, even though we don't see it in his life, achieved priestly status because he's offering these, uh, which is a little unique. And then in verse 18, it says, when David had finished offering, uh, he actually blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts. So he's like, hey, everybody, it's a new day. I'm here. I'm back. God's presence is back. I want you to leave here blessed and encouraged. And we see this a lot in Jewish tradition where uh, you will see um, a way where somebody has tried to connect obedience to blessing, right? And we've talked about that this week. Obedience brings blessing. It doesn't mean you get all the money you want. It doesn't mean you're always going to be healthy, but it means that God's blessing on our life is connected to our connection to him, which is obedience, right? And so all of this has happened. One of the coolest like descriptors of this that rabbis would do with young students is when they would get them um, to like learn new new passages, new, new passages within the Hebrew scriptures is they would like make these cookies and they would put the passage on the cookie so that as they ate the cookie, they would just even like intrinsically understand God's word is sweet, right? And so it's a little bit of that here for David, where with the people of God, he's saying like, hey, I want you to understand God's God's good. He's with us. I know that there have been difficult times, but we can trust him, right? And so I'll, I'll add that prayer request, Sarah. Thank you so much. Um, so that's, the, we see the, the specific blessing here of, uh, he gives everyone, both men and women, which is an, is an important call out because a lot of times in this case, it would just be men culturally, a cake of bread, a portion of meat, which in this culture, you didn't, that was not an assumed thing. Like meat was kind of a luxury and a cake of raisins. And so he's giving everybody each of these things and then everybody goes home. Like the party's over, amazing, so cool, what a great day. And it's important for us to understand the character in that moment for David, he just had the best day of his life. Just had the best day of his life. He's not He's not worried about getting killed. Nobody's underestimating him anymore. He's taking over the kingship. He got the Ark of the Covenant to where it belongs. Nobody died today. Amazing. He was just able to bless a bunch of people, dancing, worshiped God. You know, like maybe you've had a time like that with God. And he just found himself, oh my goodness, this is amazing. Because he doesn't know that Mikkel was watching and he doesn't know her heart right now. And so we, we kind of get to this point as things are calming down. And then it says, David returned to bless his household. He goes home. And then it says uh, that Mikal said to him, this is like just soaked in sarcasm, right? Like, oh, how the king of Israel honored himself today, uncovering himself today. And that special ephod that we talked about yesterday before the eyes of his servants, female servants, as one of the vulgar fellows shamelessly uncovers himself. She's like, basically, you're just a scoundrel, man. Like, you're just, you're just a guy doing stupid, silly stuff, and and you think it's no big deal. But like, I saw it, and it's ridiculous. Welcome home, I guess. Like that. That's the interaction. So David is like, yay, best day ever. And then, uh, and I don't know, is he like walking in with his other wives? Like he's moving in, right? And so we don't entirely get the the full picture of what's happening. But David is, you know, he's at that place where he's kind of standing back and he's going like, what did I do? Like, how did I deserve this? Because he's not thinking about what she's thinking about. He's not putting himself in that perspective. He's not walking in with humbleness. He's walking in, you know, having just been through all of that. Dom said, I'm ready to memorize scripture right now. I'm, I'm assuming if it involves cookies, right? Um, that's awesome. Jeanette said, Dom, Navigator's topical memory system is pretty good. I'm trying to work my way through it now. Look at that. 
Uh, Vicky said, I hope a cake of raisins means like raisin bread, a cake of only raisins. Yeah. Yeah. It means like, it's not a, it's not a cake. A cake. That'd be terrible. Uh, Lisa, my dad never would have done that. If you're going to be, if you're going to be a King act like it, that's funny. Yeah. I think, you know, that, that is definitely, I, I mean, even when you think about it with Saul, we see a, um, we see this kind of all out nature of David and the way he worshiped God. And it's one of the reasons that he's described as a man after God's own heart, because he was willing to himself look foolish so that God could be glorified. And, uh, and I think this idea of like, how do we be dignified in this can sometimes get in the way of what God wants to teach us in the middle of that. So, uh, so that, I mean, that's kind of where we get in the lowering tension, like what a cool moment. Amazing. Like Israel, you could argue, this is kind of what they were hoping for when they were like, we want a King like the other nations have. I mean, they wanted Saul, but they needed David. And so now they're like finally kind of getting from God take two what it was they really would have asked had they known about it. We've talked about this before. Um, Tim Keller says, uh, God gives us the things that we would pray for if we know the things that God knows. And so this idea of like, God knows what we need. And so our heart, our, our hope should be like, God, would you help me to pray in the areas that you want to deliver in my life? Because they're actually what's better for me. Israel finally got what they needed after I mean, so many years of heartache, so many years of pain and watching David almost be killed repeatedly. Um, and then Megan said, I wonder if uh, Dave, I wonder if it is David, I wonder if David was uh, able to men mentalize for uh, Mikhail, then maybe he would uh, have acted differently in how he interacted with her. I, I mean, I think, I think for all of us, right? Like, it's the lesson that we're trying to all learn right now in the midst of this is like, I don't have to have your exact experience to learn what your experience is and to, in some small way, show empathy. You know, like, I, I think it's easy to go like, well, I don't think that's true because I didn't experience it. Well, that, I mean, perception is reality in the mind of the person who has it. And so what does it look like for us uh, to humble ourselves, to listen, to learn, to model that it means I can... I can put myself in a position of a learner, even if I didn't realize I needed to before. I think that that this could have been a radically different experience for David, a radically different experience. Uh, but when we have our priority as the only priority, we get in trouble. And that's for sure where we find David right here. All right. So as we as we kind of get to this place in the story, we're going to look at lessons. And so I see, Crystal, you've already dropped one in. Um, but if you want to drop in lessons for that you think each one of these people is learning, um, I'm going to use my new trick uh, to copy and paste your lessons in here. Um, so drop them in. Uh, this is actually where I miss you, Lisa, the most is because normally I can do like a back and forth and like work well you're talking and then back and forth and so it's going to be a little clunkier than usual i'm sorry about that everybody uh we miss you lisa we miss you um and then let's see here crystal said i'm sure Mikhail learned from saul that all that matters is outward appearances i mean i definitely think that she is wrestling with the lessons that she had been learning from her dad right like th that's the only pl that she'd been uh, you know either around him or with him directly, what just happened, um, around him or with him directly uh, for a long time. And so uh, what does it look like for her to take that now and hopefully begin a different pattern, learn something different and better? Uh, Vicky said, it would be interesting to know uh, if and how Mikhail treated David was out of her hurt or uh, what it was that he did while he was on his way back. Yeah, I mean, obviously, I think it's, you know, for all of us, our reactions are a culmination. We are not, uh, we're not compartmentalized. We're, we're just one big old mess. And so figuring out like, hey, what are those key factors that made it difficult for her to really re-engage with him? I think it's everything that we've described. But I, th I think at the end of the day, uh, when you read the story, like I, I think a lot of it had to do with the fact that she had, she had begun a new home. And David had not only sent for her to be removed from that situation, but he wasn't waiting for her when she got removed. So, uh, again, we can look at it like we can we can look at it and go, why did it happen this way? And go, you know, it was not being done the way God wanted. But I think that for her, this wasn't a story. She was living it. Oh, Lisa's missing us, too. Look at that. Um, 
Any other lessons that we feel like folks are learning? I think David's learning a couple lessons, right? One lesson I think David is learning is uh, when you are obedient to God, you have a lot less to be anxious about. Right? So the first time happens, somebody dies. The second time happens and he does it the way God tells him to do it. And man, this is this amazing response, right? You see this worship come out of him. All of a sudden, it's like so many of these different restraints and areas of that are holding him back are gone. And so what a cool thing for us to be able to see um, that that could be uh, true for us as well. Um, Sarah said, I'm wondering if maybe the people are missing being led more by God and the importance of having uh, him be primary in one's life. That's an interesting perspective, Sarah. I think um, it's possible that for some people, they are thinking back to the time where, you know, God was clearly speaking through prophets. Um, the, the thing is, you know, when we go back to that time period, really the period of the judges, especially um, the, the way that it's described is that everyone did what was right in their own eyes. So even when God was in charge, the people of Israel were not listening. Uh, not by and large. And so, you know, figuring out, okay, so what does it look like? You know, it's it's this constant thing for Israel where you see them and they're like, oh, we're doing it okay. And then they screwed up. And it's like, oh, they're doing okay. And they screwed up. And they have this really unique relationship with God. And it should give us hope because we screw up and God doesn't give up. And so the amazing thing about Jesus is that we don't sit, you know, for a generation in the in wilderness because of it, because of what Jesus has done grace is immediately accessible and available. Um, but it, I, I do wonder if people are reflecting back going, man, we signed up for this. This was our call. Um, Vicky said, I actually don't know David's whole story, but I feel like this could be the beginning of David becoming a little overconfident in what he can do because he is in God's favor and things are going so well for him. He doesn't seem to make great choices. Yeah, we talked about this a little bit yesterday, right? Where, where this definitely there's some foreshadowing going on here for David, uh, where he is later in his life. We're going to get there this weekend. He is later in his life going to show that he does not have the right kind of advisors around him that have the ability to say no to him. And so uh, that is a, a tricky, tricky thing when we let ourselves get there. Uh, Lisa said, David, remember that uh, his worship is for the Lord. Even if you appear undignified and don't receive approval, even from those in your own home. Yeah. And I think that like, I mean, obviously we think about it in the microchasm of like how you worship God. Uh, but I think there is this really significant benefit to learning that um, we can look and see the way that David worships here and go, man, that's, that's an amazing thing uh, that, that he has that much reverence for God that it's just like, I'm in. Let's go. So uh, that's incredible. Cassie, unfortunately, David is learning is learning that when everything seems to be good with God, other problems can still arise. Also, even if we feel like we are doing everything right, we could be uh, we could be very wrong. What is going on between him and McCall? He has not been perfect in his own relationship with McCall, obviously. Yeah, I, I think there is there is certainly kind of some like blind spots, I think, that can develop and they can develop when everything seems to be on the right track. And it's like, oh, like we're good to go. And then there's something brewing. And I think especially when we've not been maybe as thoughtful about that relationship, it can it can crop up and become a really big problem. Vicky said, God's people are learning uh, that being obedient to God leads to better outcomes and that they may not have uh, necessarily known what they needed in a king. They are learning to trust David and his methods. I definitely think there is a uh, important aspect of what does it look like uh, for them to trust David? Because up to this point, they had trusted, um, they had trusted, Saul. And then it was like, oh, we shouldn't trust Saul anymore. And now they have a new king. And I'm sure there was some hesitation, you know, think about it today. Like I didn't vote for him, you know, like I'm sure that there was some hesitation where folks are having to go, oh, this guy's pretty good. Like, I don't know. I liked him before, but he just gave us lunch. So uh, Dom, I think maybe this is like an application thing I'll drop in here. He says, where am I, where do I allow my worship and relationship with God to live unrestrained? What's in the way of me doing that? That's good. Um, Mikhail realized that you can be so close to God and still make mistakes. Her old husband, David, 
uh, we fall short in sin, but she is really noticing it. And I think there's something so important about the way that um, we we go in situations like this where we can kind of go, hey, this person, David, I wanted to put him on this level of perfect on this pedestal. Um, but there's a there's a layer to which I, I can't do that. Like I have to recognize that at some point he's just a human being. Like he's going to make mistakes. Everybody makes mistakes. And so how do I have a conversation uh, that lets people make mistakes and still have relationship with them? Um, yeah, wow. Mikel is learning, uh, maybe learning that she just because she is a princess or a queen, she is not number one. She's not, and and really. Uh, she's probably learning firsthand what the, the what the power dynamic with with other women in David's life is going to be. Uh, but yeah, I mean, something as practical as like who is going to be in the bedroom with David? I, like questions, right? That we just think, oh yeah, this is really happening. This is an actual event. Oh my gosh, that's crazy. And so for her to be hurt, like that makes tons of sense. Like I totally get it. So. Those are really helpful, guys. Really, really appreciate that. Uh, obviously, we're going to kind of take this and we're going to go, uh, how do I apply this to my life? And so maybe it's something specific from one of those people. Maybe it's something else in the story. You're getting to see a little bit of some of those, um, some of those learnings. Dom, I'm going to go back up here and drop yours in. Um, but if you would just drop in here, Kind of whatever you know just comment with whatever it is you're thinking about or applying in your life lisa i think if i remember right maybe you had one that was um kind of like an application to uh i can't find it uh lisa said um like michael where am i showing a lack of spiritual depth and discernment bitterness jealousy and contempt uh because someone is responding differently than me. Yeah, I think that's I think that's a great question, right? Even if you think about it, it, like I think about it in worship, right? When you see somebody in worship and they're like going for it and and you're, you're like, oh, I, they're they're not. That's not real. They must be faking it. You know, and and we can have the same attitude rather than like dealing with what's going on inside of us. It's easy to put our sights on somebody else. So uh, that is a that is a good perspective. I think that's helpful. Um, I think again, where do I have carefree obedience versus careful compromise? I did. I just came up with that right now. Look at that, man. We're getting ready to preach this text. But I think the careful compromise is the way we saw Saul lead. It's the way that we saw David try to lead it at first. But even if things come that are difficult, there is a there is a carefreeness that comes from obedience that you see in David that you're like, man, I want that in my life. Where do I see that? How can I celebrate that? And where is this careful compromise that with it comes some really, really big challenges? Um, Sarah said, uh, no, is this? No, that's two things. There we go. Uh, Sarah, we are all kings and queens, princes and princesses. So we need to act like it and love others even when they don't deserve it. Yeah, well, and I think there is this like massive contrast, right? Because David is walking around with the Spirit of God living in him, leading a nation. And if we're a follower of Jesus, we're walking around with the Spirit of God inside of us. And so how do we make sure that we we understand we are, we are the royalty, we are sons and daughters of the king of the universe? How do we live and love like that even with people that don't deserve it? That's a good question. It's very good. Jeanette, at least in the moment of his worship, David had his priorities right. God first, everything else second. Am I putting God first wholeheartedly? Yeah, I think, you know, and and really um, the language I use a lot is how do I put God at the center of my life? You know, it's first for me feels like I'm making a list and that like I get done with God and move on. How can he be the center of my life, the center of the next meeting I'm in, the center of this relationship? Uh, how do I do that? I think that's great. Lisa, when is the last time I experienced the true freedom that comes from obedience? That's a great question. Great question. Lisa in the comments, spitting some bars. I think that's what the kids say. Uh, and then Eileen said, it seems like there are several warnings in David's life, and yet it's not clear that he is aware of be, uh, aware and being humbled by them. What areas in my life do I need to be humbled, seek God, and turn in a different way? Woo, Eileen, that is so good. 
Uh, and I think that what we see in David is that these are the these are almost like kind of themes in his life. These are things that show up and they don't go away. And so because he doesn't deal with them, they they get they get uh, more and more acute to the point at which uh, they become they become sort of fatal in some ways, right? Um, and I, I'm going to say a line I think this weekend uh, that failure is only fatal when it's final. And unfortunately for David, some of his faith, some of his failure was unrepentant. Some of his failure was I can't fix this. Some of his failure was this culmination of an entire life building up to it. So I think asking ourselves, what are those things in my life that it's been easy to excuse? That if somebody was describing me, oh, that's just them. You know, that's just her. That's just him. Uh, that we really need to give over to God and say, God, I, I want to see transformation in my life in this area because uh, God wants to bring freedom in your life in that area as well. Uh, C- Cassie said, I have to realize that no matter how close anyone is to God, they are still human. Everyone has their own personal problems and Satan is constantly at work in everyone's life. We all have this sinful nature that lives inside of us. And if we're not careful, it is really, really, really easy uh, for us to basically assume the best in ourselves and the worst in others. And uh, it is a damaging, damaging place to be. Dom, the other thought is that David could have reached out to Michal to bring her along with him as his wife versus just pressing on without her, without her. I pray in my life that my growth as a Christian is done together with my wife and that I'm not leaving her out or behind. That's part of my responsibility and spiritual leader of my home. Whoa, Dom, comment of the day, bro. Holy smokes. That's so good, right? Like we're not we're not gonna like leave and be gone for years, but the idea of like how do I make sure that we're in this together? That's dude, that's convicting. Woo, woo! You got a little, you got a little amen from Jeanette on that one. That is fantastic. Wow. All right, those are super helpful, guys. Uh, I think that is uh, a really, really thoughtful set of perspectives about how we can apply this. Sarah, you had a prayer request earlier. I didn't want to forget. And then I like the platform we use apparently limits how many comments. And so it is gone now, but I can, I can go get it. I can get it right now. I'm getting it. Um, I got it. This is, I miss, I miss you, Lisa. This is, this is difficult. Uh, okay. So prayer request from Sarah. She said, I have a prayer request. Can, uh, can we please pray for the police officers and other first responders amongst all the unrest in our country, uh, especially Officer Shay um, McCallanus, who was shot in the back of the head, oh, point blank, while working with riots in Las Vegas. We also need to remember, uh, be remembering James as well. Yeah, James mentioned last week he's a member of our church and just personally feeling it. And you know, I think we're in a spot right now where um, we have to be thoughtful to understand that caring for the voices of the oppressed, the voices of the marginalized, um, and caring for first responders and police officers is not mutually exclusive. We can do both at the same time. And so uh, I think just I would just encourage you to continue to encourage you. If you have somebody in your life, um, especially if you have somebody in your life, a, a black man or woman in your, in your life, uh, that you can just like reach out and say, how are you doing? Um, what do you need right now? Uh, you will learn, you will be blessed by that conversation. It will be awkward. It will be difficult, but it will be valuable. Um, but obviously we are, uh, we are grieving the loss of life. Uh, not only, um, the loss of life that, that, um, really started all of this with Mr. Floyd, but unfortunately the loss of life that's happened subsequently. So we'll be praying for all the things that are happening in our country in just a minute. All right. Well, hey, I really appreciate you guys uh, sticking with me and joining with just me. Like I said, tomorrow, I am sure that we will have Lisa back. It'll be great. Um, uh, And we will finish this story. We will get into the conclusion of it and we will talk about what are the tensions, uh, what is the resolution, and then what are the things that are kind of growing out of it. Um, that are going to show us even from a foreshadowing perspective where we're going to be this weekend and then especially where we're going to be next week. I've heard it said this way, um, that that when you live a morally compromised life, uh, it usually doesn't affect uh, people that are like working with you as much as quickly, but where it really shows up is in the respect that your grown kids have for you. And so if you are not the real deal and you're just faking it, your grown children will have a lack of respect for you that is difficult, if not impossible, to get back. So we'll talk about that next week. 
I'm going to pray for us, and uh, we will join back together uh, tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. Better than ever, because Lisa will be with us. I remembered my four roar shirt today. Dom and I were joking. It would be really difficult if I didn't, because I couldn't have made it back in fourth year in time before that. Um, but just want to give you a reminder that if you are looking to help, want to help, need to know someone who needs help, uh, check out Four Aurora. Today is Marketplace Day. So I think I hear a giant refrigerator truck in our parking lot that's running with food in it to keep it cold all night because we don't have a fridge or a freezer that big. Uh, and then uh, the team is getting ready, uh, I'm sure, all ready to be able to serve so many people. Thanks so much to so many of you who do that. Anyway, appreciate you guys. Let me, um, oh, hold on one second. What chapter will we be on this weekend. So this weekend, um, we are uh, covering the um, David and Bathsheba section in David's life. So it's actually two chapters. Second uh, Samuel, I think I want to say 11 and 12. Uh, yeah, Second Samuel 11 and 12 is where we're going to be this weekend. Hey, look at that. Lisa, come. Oh, man, you guys are you guys are on board. You get it. You're fine. All right. Let me pray for us. God, thank you. Thank you so much um, that we can come before you, uh, that God with obedience comes freedom. It comes uh, it comes anxiety waning. It comes um, a chance to be able to, to rest in you. And so I pray that even in the midst of so much unrest, we could choose to find our rest in you. Uh, God, we pray for our nation right now. Uh, we pray for leaders who are making decisions as we continue to navigate the effects of COVID, even as we celebrate. Uh, it sounds like, um, you know, even a local hospital saying, hey, it feels like we're we're coming back towards some version of normal. Uh, we celebrate that. Uh, but we pray, God, we pray for um, Mr. Floyd's funeral and the, the things that are coming towards that. And uh, we pray, God, that for the African-American community in our nation, uh, that this would not just be another event that we go back to normal from, uh, but that individually as organizations and as a nation, we would create systems and strategies to listen more effectively so that we can make changes more systematically so that we can bring justice to all. God, because you are for justice for all. And God, we pray for the protection of our first responders, our police officers, folks that are in the streets, God, that you would um, help them to keep us safe. Um, and that God, those who are using this as a cover for evil, for all kinds of nonsense, um, I pray God that they would not mute the voice of the oppressed. I pray that their efforts would be thwarted. And I pray God that you would prevent loss of life and prevent damage physically so that we could think about and focus on the spiritual, emotional, social damage that has been done, um, that we can be a part of the solution for. Thank you, God, that in you, we can turn to you for hope in this time. I pray that we would, even as we have some of these difficult conversations. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, thanks so much, everybody. Thanks for being here. Thanks for being with us for this time. I'll see you tomorrow morning at 8 a.m.